Hello and welcome, and this is a football history of Florida State. So let's get right into it. In 1851, the state of Florida officially voted to start a university in the state capital of Tallahassee. The university wouldn't open for another six years, however, as in 1857, the university would officially open its doors. But it wouldn't become the Florida State we all know until 1891, as Florida State at that time would start to call themselves Florida State University and use the mascot Seminole. But it wasn't until 1803, however, that the state of Florida would officially recognize Florida State as Florida State University. As a matter of fact, they would recognize it as Florida State University of Women. Now, Florida State also had two satellite universities in the 1800s. One was a science and technology school that was split off and moved to Orlando, Florida, and become the University of Central Florida. The other was a medical school that would split off and move to Gainesville and become the University of Florida. But at this time, Florida State was seen as the Florida State University for Women. The Seminoles were an exclusive girls' school. There were no male students of any kind or color. Now we are jumping way ahead to 1942. In 1942, like most universities in the country, Florida State doubled as a field hospital and a training facility for some of the members of our country's armed forces as they prepared to go overseas to fight in the Second World War. Florida State would also work as a field hospital to help injured GIs coming back from the war zone in Europe and the Pacific. Interesting in all this was the relationship built between Florida State its administrative staff, and the, and the GIs and U.S. soldiers who were there injured. In 1945, Florida State started to allow some of those wounded GIs to go to school at Florida State. However, Florida State was still officially an all-girls school, even though it had started adding male students. Perhaps they believed at the time that their service to their country meant they should have been able to choose any university they wanted. But for whatever reason, they started adding in these young men. In 1947, Florida State would officially stop being Florida State University for Women. The title would be changed to Florida State, and they would allow men and women to both attend a university. Now, this is critical for the purpose of our video, because you can't play college football without men. However, one, one man on Florida State's board in this era did see the potential future. Henry Edward Williamson, also known as Ed, would become the father of Florida State's college football program. In 1940, he began to push for a return to a football program for the team and began to push for the integration of male students. In 1945, he started to gain some traction as male students came back to the school. And in 1947, Florida State would officially found its football program. The Seminoles' first season was an absolute disaster as the school had no recruits, no five-star talent, no top-end players. They essentially just put together a group of players from people on campus. They didn't even have a head coach at this time as Ed himself would become the first head coach of the Seminoles. The team was terrible as expected, going 0-5. And at this point, Florida State was a Division II school what is now known as the FCS, or Football Championship Subdivision. Florida State would stay that way for quite a while. While Williamson would only stay a single season as Florida State's head coach, he was nevertheless instrumental in reviving the Florida State football program from the dead. But in 1948, Florida State would hire Don Villa, who would become Florida State's second head coach. Don would actually have incredible success in the FCS division, going 7-1 and his first season. He would follow that up with a 9-1 and season and an 8-0 and season, which is great success after the school had lost its first five games in its first year. In 1851, and in no small part, Due to Don Villa's success as an FCS school, Florida State would take that next step to become an FBS school. Florida State would become an independent team, much like modern teams like Notre Dame and SMU. The Seminoles would play their first season as an FBS team and would actually seem to fit in quite well. I'd imagine a lot of people in this era 
immediately thought this was going to be a lot of fun, as Florida State would finish 6-2. and two. This was a shocking outcome for a team that had only been founded in 1947. However, reality often sets in, and in 1952, reality set in for the Seminoles, and Don was fired, following a 1-8-1 season. We can infer from this that Florida State had started to believe that they would need a better coach to compete at the level of college football they were now at. However, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that Don was responsible for some positives. For example, his excellent 24-2 record as an FCS school helped Florida State become an FBS school. Although, admittedly, his paltry 7-10 record as an FBS school led to him being let go. Now, trying to follow the success of old Don, in 1953, Florida State would hire Tom, I believe that's Nugman. Now, we can infer that Florida State believed they needed a coach who had been tested at the FBS level to be more competitive. Tom Nugman had been the head coach of Virginia Military University, who would later just become known as Virginia University, who had played in the Southern Conference. The Southern Conference would later be merged with the Southeastern Conference. But either way, Tom had had experience at the highest level of college football, and because of that, Florida State hoped he would help them get back on track. In 1953, it seemed like hiring Tom was a massive disaster. The Knolls would fall to 5-5, five and five, and still, had failed to really be competitive. Florida State's best season was 6 wins. Now, admittedly, in that era, they were playing 8 games, but now Florida State was playing 10, and still only winning 5. Florida State fans at this point were probably just happy to watch football games and didn't have much expectation. However, in 1954, only seven years after Florida State was born as a college football team, the Nords would finish 8-4 and four and head to their very, very first bowl game. Florida State would play in the 1955 Sun Bowl against Texas Western University which would eventually become known as the University of Texas at El Paso, also known as the UTEP Miners, a Conference USA team. Florida State would get absolutely devastated in this game, losing by 27 points to the Miners. The Knolls were clearly not ready for the big time yet, as this was just a trip to the Sun Bowl. This wasn't even a trip to a New Year's Six game. However, Florida State had finally broken over. I have no doubt many of the fans probably believe this would be the turning point to put Florida State on the national map. And why not? Florida State had gone 8-4. It had only been a few years since Florida State had left the FCS to become an FBS team. So Florida State fans had every right to believe this was going to be a sign of things to come. Unfortunately, to quote Ted Lasso, it's the hope that kills, and Florida State would slump back down to irrelevance. And the following... Three seasons, from 1955 to 1957, Florida State would fail to post a single winning record. Florida State failed to be competitive during this era, and the Knowles would go a paltry 14-15-1 over this period. This would lead to Tom Nugmit becoming the first lame duck coach in Florida State history. By this true, his final season of his contract, in 1958, the Knolls were able to rise back up to the level of 7-4 and four and go to the school's second bowl game. The writing was still on the wall for head coach Tom Nugmit. It didn't help that Oklahoma State embarrassed the Seminoles, crushing Florida State 15-6, to with Florida State getting two field goals late fourth quarter after the game was already over. Florida State had seen enough of Tom Nugmit, and following the loss, Tom Nugmit was fired. In 1959, Florida State would hire Perry Moss. Florida State would have high hopes for the former Heisman Trophy winner, but following a paltry 4-6 and six start, Perry Moss was unceremoniously fired after only a single season, beginning Florida State's unofficial policy of firing coaches almost immediately if they don't show instant success. This means Florida State was once again searching for a head coach after only one season, and following the ridiculously poor Tom Nugmit years and the one awful Perry Moss year, it was obvious Florida State needed to get it right this time. In 1960, Florida State would make a great decision by hiring Bill Peterson. Bill Peterson would begin his coaching career as a high school coach and then would win a national championship as an assistant coach at LSU. 
following LSU's national championship season, Florida State would hire Bill Peterson to become the next head coach. Now, Florida State was more had much more faith in Bill Peterson than it did in Perry Moss, as Bill Peterson's start at Florida State was actually not a whole hell of a lot better than Perry Moss's. From 1960, Peterson's first year, to 1963, Florida State didn't post a single winning record, with a depressing depressing record of three and six, four and five, three and three, and three, three ties, four, five, and one. Florida State would also have six ties over this period and finish this long stretch with 17 wins, 19 losses, and six ties. Florida State has shown much more patience with Bill Peterson than they had with Tom Nugmit or Perry Moss. It was most likely due to his national championship as an assistant coach at LSU. However, coming into season four, we can easily assume that Bill Peterson was on the ward's largest hot seat due to a complete and utter lack of success over his previous three years. But in 1964, everything changed for Florida State. Bill Peterson would lead Florida State to its first victory over the University of Florida, which obviously was a big deal. Peterson would also get the first, the school's first victory over an SEC school. On top of that, Peterson would have a great record of 9-1-1. One, and one. Also, following an October 10th victory over number 5 Kentucky, Florida State would go all the way up to the number 8 team in the country. Florida State would then beat Georgia, which was the first victory the Seminoles had ever had over an SEC school. The Noles would suffer their very first loss the following weekend, however, against VPI Grand Football. VPI Grand Football would become known as Virginia Tech University. Florida State would be number one coming into that game against Virginia Tech, but following that loss, the Noles would lose the coveted number one spot. Florida State would go on to beat Southern Miss the next weekend before tying with the University of Houston, beating NC State, Florida, and then shockingly upsetting the 15th ranked Oklahoma Sooners in the Gator Bowl. The 1964 season was one of the early Seminoles' most crowning achievement and the best season Florida State had had since becoming an FBS school. But it would also allow Seminole fans to hope that Florida State was about to become one of college football's elite. However, in 1965, the Florida State team would implode falling from a true national championship contender all the way back down to 6-5. and five. In spite of Florida State going to a ball game, however, this slide would continue in the 1966 season as Florida State would finish 6-5 and five again. Florida State's most notable victory in the 1966 season was a 23-20 win over the Hurricanes. They would lose the following week to Florida and Virginia Tech again. In spite of the slink back to mediocrity, however, Florida State had been growing in popularity. In the earlier bowl appearance, the Norse only had 3,000 people in attendance, with only a few hundred of those actually paid. By the end of this season, Florida State had 30,000 paying people in Florida State's Dope Campbell Stadium. This meant Florida State's audience was also growing. Notre Dame would claim the national championship in the 1966 season. Florida State would finally begin to turn things around, though, in the 1967 season. The Seminoles and Old Billy would go 7-2-2. Two, two. The Seminoles would open the 1967 season with a shockingly one-sided defeat to Houston before tying number 2 Alabama. Florida State would drop a game the very next weekend to NC State before rolling off seven straight victories in order to head to the Gator Bowl against 10th-ranked Penn State. Florida State would end up dropping the Gator Bowl to 10th-ranked Penn State, but again, you can see the growing numbers. This game had 70,000 people there, all paid, and was on ABC, one of the first televised games for the Seminoles. Florida State was starting to become far more of a national power and household name than they were before that. So before we get to the 1967 season, there's a few things to take a second to mention. In the 1964 season, Bill Peterson would hire a young, ambitious assistant head coach. A man that Florida State fans would come to know and love very, very well in the coming years. That man was Bobby Bowden would become the assistant head coach of Florida State in 1964. In 1967, Bill Peterson would become the first major coach at a major university to recruit an African-American 
football player. In 1967, the Seminoles would sign Ernest Cook as a fullback, making Florida State one of the first universities to have an African-American player on its team. All of this added to the legend that was becoming Bill Peterson, who is unfortunately a largely forgotten head coach in college football history and Florida State history, as he, in a lot of ways, started to build the program into what we all know and love today. He was Bobby Bowden before Bobby Bowden. He also introduced Bobby to the program, which would come into play in just about 10 years, and was the first head coach at Florida State to actually target African-American players. Without all of these things, Florida State wouldn't be the school we know and love now. So, obviously, Bill Peterson deserves far more credit than the man gets for being an excellent coach and obviously a good person because in this era, recruiting African-Americans was something that would get you a lot of flack. Back to football now. In 1968, Florida State would go... 8-3, and which is one of the team's best records, and the best record the team had had since 1964. Florida State would open the 1968 season with a 10-point win over Maryland before getting defeated by everyone's least favorite team, the University of Florida, who was fifth ranked that season. They would lose 9-3 to to the Gators before beating Texas A&M, who was ranked 17th. Florida State will continue their struggles with Virginia Tech on November 7th, dropping the game by 20 points before rolling off four straight victories over NC State, Wake Forest, Houston, who was ranked 10th, and going on to play LSU in the Peach Bowl. Florida State would drop the game, however, to the 19th-ranked LSU Tigers, 31-27. However, Florida State was back in a bowl game, and the Seminoles had Bobby Bowden on staff, and everything seemed to be looking up. In 1969, Florida State would go back to being hopefully mediocre. The Norths would go 6-3-1, and one, losing games to Florida and Gainesville, which unfortunately was becoming a tradition in early Seminole years, tie with Virginia Tech, which apparently was a thing that Florida State had a hard time with with beating Virginia Tech, dropping a game to Mississippi State and losing to Houston. The Norths' notable victories of the season came against Miami, South Carolina, and North Carolina State, and North Carolina State was another early televised game for the Seminoles. Allowing Florida State to get on TV is fairly important. you got to understand, in this era, most college football games were not televised. In 1970 was Billy Peterson's final season, as he would depart Florida State to go to the NFL following the 1970 season. The Seminoles would open the season with a victory over Louisville before losing to Georgia Tech by 10 points. The Seminoles would beat Wake Forest the following week before dropping games to Florida and Mississippi State and back-to-back losses to SEC teams. But the Norths would actually have a nice run to end the season, beating South Carolina, Miami, Clemson, and now Virginia Tech was using the name Virginia Tech, and Kansas State before getting absolutely annihilated by Houston on November 26th in Tampa, Florida in a bowl game. The Seminoles would finish the season unranked and unremarked. But it was the final season for one of Florida State's greatest football coaches. When Bill Peterson became the head coach at Florida State in 1960, the Norths had just embarked on a long, tragic period of losing. Florida State had struggled through the Tom Nugment and Perry Marsh years, and it was clear a huge change was needed. At first, it seemed like Billy Peterson was not going to be that change. His first three years at Florida State saw the losing continue. But from the 1964 season onward, it was obvious that that Billy Peterson was going to be that guy. And Florida State was able to continue to be successful until Billy Peterson decided to go to the NFL, where he would have a depressing 1-18 record before being fired. Peterson would never coach again in college or pro football. However, it was obvious later on that Bill Peterson regretted his decision to leave Florida State and go to the NFL. He had been so successful at Florida State, perhaps maybe he would have even become Florida State's greatest legend had he not decided to go to the National Football League. The man would admit later in interviews that he would tear up at times when he realized his coaching career was over. You have to give the man all the props in the world. He lifted the Florida State program up from a laughingstock joke afterthought into the national eye. He also introduced future Florida State Hall of Fame legend Bobby Bowden to the program. It's possible that Bobby Bowden never would have become a Florida State head coach without Bill Peterson. 
So while he didn't have the same impact that Bobby Bowden was, his assistant head coach, just a few years later, he had helped Florida State become a credible football school. Unfortunately for Bill Peterson, he would never coach another football game in his life after failing in the NFL. Following the departure of Billy Peterson, Florida State would hire Larry Johnson to be the next head football coach, and at first it seemed that Larry Johnson was the right man for the job. Florida State would open up Larry Johnson's first season as head coach at Florida State by rolling off five consecutive victories, beating teams like Southern Miss, Miami, Kansas, Virginia Tech, and Mississippi State. However, the evil that was Florida would welcome Florida State into Gainesville in front of 65,000 people and lose 17-15. to The Seminoles, however, at this point were 6-1 before beating South Carolina to go to 7-1. Struggles would continue as they would lose to Houston and drop another game to Georgia Tech. And Florida State would get back on track, beating Tulsa and Pittsburgh. This would send Florida State to their first appearance in what would become known as the New Year's Six game. On December 27, 1972, Florida State would play 8th-ranked Arizona State, a game they would lose by a single touchdown. And the Seminoles would have two televised games this year as well. Everything still seemed to be looking up. This was easily Florida State's most impressive ball appearance in their time as a college. Overall, a fantastic season for the Seminoles, and no reason for anyone to assume Florida State was about to fall off. In 1972, Florida State would finish their season 7-4. and four. The Seminoles would again start the season with five consecutive victories, before again losing to Florida on October 7th. This seems to be becoming a tradition. Florida State would get back on track just like the year before, rolling off two consecutive wins before again losing back-to-back -back games, this time to Auburn and Houston. Florida State would beat Tulsa to end the season again by a field goal before losing their ball game to South Carolina 24-21. But still, there was reason for hope. So let's take a snapshot here before we go on to the next season. So very quietly, from 1964 to 1972, Florida State had become a very successful football program, going 62 and 26 over this period. So Seminole fans at this time had every reason to believe they were actually a pretty good football team. However, unfortunately, the bottom was about to fall out. In 1973, Florida State went a depressing 0-11. Florida State would lose games to Miami, Wake Forest, be shut out by Kansas, demolished by Houston, and absolutely embarrassed by Florida and Gainesville. This would also be Larry Jones' final season, as he was fired following the conclusion of an 0-11 season. As Florida State would hire Daryl Mundra, who had been very successful head coach at Western Illinois going 39-13, However, Darrell would absolutely shit the bed as Florida State's head coach, which for our Seminole fans is the greatest thing that could have happened because it allowed the doors to be open to what happened next. But before we get to what happened next, let's talk about Darrell the Failure. Darrell the Failure would be absolutely annihilated his first year at Florida State, losing seven straight games to start the season. This included notable losses to Pittsburgh, Florida, Alabama, and Auburn, before shockingly upsetting Miami to win the only game of the season he would win before losing two more games to Houston and Virginia Tech. Dale had proven to be an underwhelming head coach right off the bat. However, Florida State decided to give him a second season. Once again, as we point out, Florida State's tradition is that you don't get very long if you're not winning. Willie Taggart isn't the first head coach you want to get two seasons. Darrell also only got two seasons. And in the second season, Darrell went 3-8. and eight. No one knew good enough to keep his job. He would lose the opener to Texas Tech before beating Utah State before rolling off five straight losses. I'd imagine following the end of the fifth straight loss, Florida State was already looking for a new head coach. Florida State would also continue the losing ways to Florida as it had now been years, almost a decade, since the Seminoles had managed to beat the Gators. Florida State would shock everyone by upsetting number 19 Clemson 43-7 before finishing with losses to Miami, Mississippi State, and beating Houston. This would be the last 
season for Dell as Florida State's head coach. The Florida State had fallen back down after having a fantastic period from 1964 to 1972. From 1973 until 1975, Florida State had gone 4-29. and It couldn't have been more obvious at this point a change was needed. And for that change, Florida State reached out to West Virginia head coach and former Florida State assistant coach, Alabama University alumni, Bobby Bowden. Bobby Bowden had shown great success at West Virginia. So much so, in fact, that Florida State thought he could be the answer to solve the Seminoles' problems. Bobby had gone 42-26 and 26 at West Virginia. It's also worth mentioning that following the devastating plane crash at Marshall University that killed the entire football team, Bobby Bowden allowed Marshall to have his playbooks. This is unheard of as West Virginia and Marshall were huge rivals in the era. To give you an example, this would be like... Alabama giving Auburn access to all their playbooks after a plane crash, or Florida State allowing Miami to have access to all of our plays after a plane crash. This was something that would never happen today and continues to show what kind of a class act Bobby Bowden was. The host Jack Langle. Jack, Bobby Bowden. Bobby Bowden. Pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Bobby, thank you for taking the time with us today. My pleasure, not a problem. All right. Yes, sir. So, I can't wait to hear. What can I do for you boys? We're thinking about adopting the veer this year. And I understand that to be your bread and butter, as it were, so... Playbooks, research, game film, need anything copied or dubbed, just see Kitty down the hall. Coach, you serious? Sure. We don't play y'all this year, so what the heck, have at it. Just make sure you put everything back where you found it when you threw. In 1976... The greatest head coach in the history of Florida State would embark on his maiden journey. Florida State would go 5-6 and six in Bobby Bowden's first year. Now, I plan to do an entire video chronicling the history of Bobby Bowden as Florida State's head football coach later this year, but this one's more about the history of the Florida State football program. So stay tuned for the Bobby Bowden video later on. So in Bobby's first season at Florida State, the Seminoles would drop their first three games, which had to be pretty disappointing for Seminole fans following the massive failure of the last few years. Florida State's notable losses in those first three games were to Miami and Oklahoma. Most embarrassingly was the absolute destruction Bobby Bowden caught at the hands of the Hurricanes, losing 47 to nothing. But Florida State would show some flashes of the team they would become under Bobby as Two weeks later, on October 9th, Florida State would head to play 13th-ranked Boston College and absolutely annihilate them, a tradition that seems to have continued even to this day, as Florida State has pretty much dominated Boston College for decades. Florida State would win 28-9 before losing yet another game to Florida. It had now been years since Florida State had beaten the Gators. Losses to Auburn and Clemson also made sure that Florida State would miss a ball game. However, Bobby Bowden showed some life at the end of the season, rolling off three straight wins over Virginia Tech, North Texas, and, and Southern Miss. Bobby Bowden's first season would have definitely given Florida State fans reason to be hopeful. Because remember, Florida State's previous three seasons had led the Seminoles to going a shockingly disgusting 4-29. and Bobby Bowden totaled the win total of his two predecessors in only one season. Florida State fans would not have to wait long for their optimism to pay off. In the 1977 season, Florida State would take the first steps to becoming the superpower they would become. Florida State would absolutely dominate in 1977. Florida State would go was shocking 10 and 2. And any question about whether or not Bobby Bowden was a man to fix this program was gone. Florida State would open the season with a crushing win over Southern Miss before beating Kansas State, losing at home to the Hurricanes by a touchdown, beating a ranked Oklahoma State, Virginia Tech, and finally, to what must have felt like an eternity, in Gainesville, Florida State on ABC in front of a national audience was able to pants the University of Florida 37 to 9. Bobby Bowden had already proven himself in only his second season as the future head coach at Florida State. Florida State would head to the first ball game in almost four years and absolutely annihilate Texas Tech 
40 to 17. Bobby's success at this season had put Florida State back on the map and made Florida State relevant after almost four years of mediocrity. The Seminole program was not seen as a force to be reckoned with yet, but it was quickly becoming that. In 1978, Florida State and its legendary head coach Bobby Bowden would actually take a tiny step back as Florida State would go 8-3. and three. Well, don't get me wrong, this was still great for the Seminoles given how the success of recent years had gone. Florida State would have no victories over ranked opponents in the 1978 season, only playing one single game against a ranked opponent in which they would lose 7-3. Florida State was still only half-baked. They were not the dominant superpower they were just about to become. But in 1979, Seminoles would finally take that next step to college football superstardom, as the Noles would finish their first perfect regular season in school history. Florida State would actually only even be challenged in three games that year and would get their second consecutive win over Florida and second consecutive win over Miami. Florida State on January 1st would head to play number 5 Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl. A chance for Florida State to claim their first national title. The Noles would go up 7-0 in the first quarter before allowing Oklahoma to score 17 consecutive points in the second quarter. The Sooners would carry that 17-7 lead into the fourth. Oklahoma would tack on a final touchdown to win 24-7 ending Florida State's hope to win their first national championship in school history. Why I'm sure losing what amounted to a national championship game was a crushing disappointment. It made a statement to all of college football, and that statement was Florida State had arrived. But in Bobby Bowden's own words, Florida State would not become a college football superpower, in his opinion, until the 1980 season. Florida State would start the 1980 season ranked 13th. The Noles would roll off three consecutive wins to start the year, but in a shocking turn of events against East Carolina in a 63-7 victory, the Seminoles' starting center and backup center would be hurt. Get the picture. Uh, at that time, Florida State did not have a big name with the big people. You know, and uh, so we had, we had opened the season. We won our first game, won our second game, won our third game. And then the third game, our center tore his knee up and he's out for the year. So we put our second team center in there. Well, five plays later, he sprains his ankle. He's out. He can't walk. Now we don't have a center. But, but we had worked our right guard, our starting right guard. We had practiced him snapping the ball just in case that ever happens. If you notice, you hardly ever lose centers. You lose running backs, you lose linebackers, but you hardly ever lose a center. We lost two. You think a quarterback's available? Who you think gives him the dead gum ball every, every dead gum play? That center starts every play. But anyway, so anyway, anyway, this guard starts the game. It's the fourth quarter. We're beating them 40 something to nothing, so we win anyway. You know, we win anyway. And so then we go back next, uh, next week. We're going to play Miami in Miami. And this time, Miami wasn't very good either. This is back when neither one was very good, you know. And uh, I think we were probably 10 or 12 point favorites. Well, Dad, gummit, we, okay, this guard's going to have to start setting. He, but he, he'll be okay. You know, we'll beat Miami, you know. So we go down there and play them. We fumble 10 times just between the snap of the quarterback and the center. We fumble 10 of them. They get five of them. They upset us 10 to 9, you know. The next week, we're going to play the number three team in the nation, Nebraska, at Nebraska. Now, back in those days, people don't beat Nebraska out there. Now, lately, they've been getting, getting on them a little bit, but you, you, you just don't beat them out there, you know. So we just lost a game 10-9 to in Miami, and I ain't even got a dead gum center. And I remember getting our coaches together and said, man, we got two centers on our freshman team. And uh, one of them was a center we'd signed out of Ohio, about 6'3", about 235, and a and, uh, big, nice, physical kid. Now, listen, uh, 6'3", 235, back in uh, 80, that was big. You can't even play now unless you're 300. <laughs> on the line of scrimmage. If you ain't 300, you might as well forget it, you know? Well, anyway, but he, we had this big center from Cincinnati. Then we had a, we had a walk-on kid from Savannah, Georgia, you know, non-scholarship. And uh, well, we had no choice. Coaches, get those two centers and work them and work them equally. 
Give, them, give him five snaps and give him five. Then give him five and just run on. At the end of the week, we're going to decide who starts. So they did that. Thursday rolled around. All right, coaches, who are we going to, who are we going to start center? We all agreed that walk on. That walk on whatever fumble. He never misses a snap. The other kid, he, he can block, you know, but that give me a fumble every fifth time. <laughs> so we got to go with this boy that can snap the ball. So we go up to Nebraska, and of course they're heavy favorites, and we, uh, they got us 14 nothing first quarter. It's gonna, they're going to beat us pretty good, you know. 14 or nothing the first quarter. Well, we hang on, and uh, we kick a field goal right before the half, go out 14 to 3. We come out the second half, and uh, our defense starts really playing good. We, we kind of shut them down. We finally eked in a touchdown. I think we kicked four field goals that day, and we upset them. They, they had the ball on our one-yard line. It showed it in that film a while ago. They had the ball on our three-yard line first down. They fumbled. We got it. That's the game, you know. But that was probably one of the biggest wins at Florida State ever. Uh, I, th I thought it put us on the map. People begin to say, well, who is this Florida State? Look what they did up there at Nebraska, see? Now, of course, after that, we beat a lot of folks. We beat Notre Dame. We beat Michigan. We beat everybody. So now we hear Bobby Bowden say that the victory over Nebraska in the 1980 season was the moment, in his opinion, where Florida State arrived. I still would have to argue a little bit that playing in what was a de facto national championship game at the end of the 1979 season most likely hailed Florida State's arrival. But the victory over Nebraska was a massive deal, and who am I to argue with the greatest coach in college football? If Bobby Bowden says this is the moment Florida State became a superpower, then this is the moment Florida State became a superpower. Florida State would continue the success the rest of the year as they would head to Gainesville and get their third consecutive victory over hated rival Florida. Following this victory over Florida, Florida State would move up to number two as they would play number four Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl. Now, for a second time in Bobby Bowden's career, and a second time in two years, Florida State was facing Oklahoma in what likely would give them a national championship. This time, neither team would find offensive success in the first quarter, as Oklahoma would take the lead, scoring a field goal to start the second. Florida State would respond by scoring a touchdown to go up 7-3. However, the Sooners would answer that in the early third quarter, scoring a touchdown to go up 10-7. The Noles would tack on a field goal in the late third quarter to make it 10-10, and then Florida State would add a touchdown early fourth quarter to go up 17-10. With the game on the line, the Sooners drove down the field and punched the ball into the end zone to make it 16 to 17. Oklahoma would then elect to go for two in the game rather than playing for a tie as there was no overtime in this era. Oklahoma would unfortunately find themselves getting the two-point conversion to upset Florida State 18 to 17 and once again in Florida State's hopes of claiming a national championship. In by about a short time he had entirely turned it around Florida State had had two chances to win national championships before losing both of them to Oklahoma. At this point, Bobby Bowden was already a made man in Tallahassee. 1981, however, the Noles took the largest step back they would at any point in Bobby Bowden's career. The 1981 season saw Florida State finishing only 6-5. This was a big surprise for a team that had been so dominant in the previous three seasons. Florida State would lose the rematch to Nebraska before shocking the world by beating Ohio State, losing to number three Pittsburgh, who would finish that year winning the Sugar Bowl as the number two team in the country, would not win a national championship, but probably should have, would beat LSU before losing to Miami and Florida. Bobby Bowden's second loss to the Gators, but it was an absolute rout. This was undoubtedly the worst season of Bobby Bowden's career until some of the ones near the end of it. But in traditional Bobby fashion, he would never stay down for too long. The Seminoles would go 9-3 in the 1982 season, with the Florida State's only three losses coming at the hands of Pittsburgh, LSU, and Florida. Notable victories of the season came over a ranked Miami opponent, and Bobby Bowden would play his old team for the first time on December 30th in the Gator Bowl. Number 10 ranked West Virginia would play Florida State, who was unranked in this particular matchup, as the Seminoles would defeat West Virginia 31-12. 
and would finish the season ranked 10th. The following season for the Seminoles, they would do just a tiny bit worse, losing one additional game. Florida State again would be decimated by an extremely difficult schedule, playing 13th ranked LSU, 10th ranked Auburn, 6th ranked Miami, and 12th ranked Florida. Florida State would lose all but one of their games against ranked opponents. And, for, and the only real notable victory on the season for Florida State was over LSU. The Miami Hurricanes would claim their first national championship in 1983. However, this was wide right one, as Florida State would lose 17-16 to to the Hurricanes, who were the eventual national champions. Bobby Bowden would suffer another humiliating loss by the Florida Gators, losing 53-14 to in Gainesville. Florida would finish the season ranked 6, and Miami would finish the season with a national championship. This was a pretty common place in the 80s, however. The 1984 season, Florida State would take another small step back as Florida State would go 7-3-2. Now, it's important to remember in this, in this era of college football, there was no overtime. So, if a game ended with a tie, the game just ended with a tie. That's why in these early years, you see so many ties. Florida State's notable games in the 1984 season was a massive victory over Miami, 38-3. The defending national champion were routed by the Seminoles at Miami. That Miami team turned out to not be quite as good that year, though, as it went 8-5 and five and finished 18th. Florida State also would suffer losses to South Carolina, Auburn, and Florida, all ranked, and would tie in the Citrus Bowl against Georgia. 1984 was notable for being one of the worst years for Bobby Bowden at Florida State. Florida State would go 7-3-2. And, and while the 98 season would show a slight improvement, 96 would drop Florida State back down to 7 wins. Fortunately, however, 1996 would mark the end of about six years of mediocrity for Florida State. During this period, Florida State only had two nine-win seasons and only finished in the top 15 twice over that period. It was probably the worst period in Bobby Bowden's career at Florida State until the last couple years before he was forced out by Jimbo Fisher. In 1987, Florida State would go 11-1. and Now, I do know that Bobby Bowden said in an interview that he would claim this as a national championship season on his gravestone. In 1987, Florida State opened the season with four consecutive wins, the most notable of which coming against Michigan State. But the game that cost Florida State the national championship in the de facto national championship game of that year was played October 3rd at 2.30 p.m. at Dope Campbell Stadium as Florida State would play rival Miami. In what was a very competitive all-time great game, Florida State would possess the ball with the clock running out down 26-25. Florida State would trot Raiders legend and Florida State's legend kicker Sebastian Jankowski onto the field to attempt a shockingly short 39-yard field goal. However, in Florida State's grim tradition, the field goal would sail slightly wide right, leaving Bobby Bowden staring up at the scoreboard confused as Florida State would drop the game 26-25 to the Miami Hurricanes. Bobby Bowden would say in a later interview he will claim this national championship on his gravestone. In typical angry, very good team fashion, Florida State would win the next five games by 14 or more, with four of those five games being won by 40 or more. Florida State would then go play 5th ranked Nebraska in the Sun Bowl, where the Seminoles would actually beat the Cornhuskers 31-28. However, Miami would play number two Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl and would beat them 20 to 14. This meant that Miami was a unanimous national champion. Florida State really should have claimed this national title that year if it wasn't for a small missed field goal. Bobby Bowden would have won his first national title. Every bit as dominant and every bit as good the following season, Florida State would go 11 and one for a second straight year. With again, Florida State's only loss coming at the hands of the eventual national champion runner-up, Miami. Florida State started the season ranked number one, while Miami started the season ranked number six. However, in front of 77,000 people, Florida State was pantsed by last year's national champion, as Miami crushed Florida State 31 to nothing. 
Florida State would not lose another game the rest of the season, including a victory over Auburn in the Sugar Bowl. But unfortunately for Florida State, the absolute devastation by Miami was not something Florida State was ever able to overcome, as the Seminoles would rise to the number three team in the nation, but never surpassed that to become the number one team. Bobby Bowden's dominance would continue all the way up to the 2000 season. Florida State would continue their success in the 1989 and 1990 seasons. However, both seasons they would drop two games falling short of playing for a national championship. In the 1991 season, Florida State would go 11-2, with both losses coming to in-state rivals Florida and Miami. The 1991 season is another season where Florida State could have won a national championship. If not for a missed field goal against Miami, the Seminoles likely would have become a national champion. Miami again would eventually end up winning the national championship in this season when they would have crushed Nebraska 22 to nothing. But most interesting of the 1991 season is it was Florida State's last year as independent as Florida State's massive success over the previous five years had caught the attention of the Atlantic Coast Conference. The ACC was looking to expand in this era and was eager to add Florida State as one of their big teams. Florida State would officially play their first season as an ACC team in the 1992 season. Bobby's infinite success up to this point and complete turnaround of the Florida State program would actually continue. Florida State would finish the 1992 season 11-1 as again a missed field goal would send Florida State home with a loss against hated rival Miami who would then lose to Alabama in a de facto national championship game. Still, we hadn't reached the point of the BCS where national championship games were actually played. Unfortunately, Florida State field goal struggles cost him a chance to win a national championship in the 1992 season. Now, it remains to be seen whether or not Florida State would have beaten Alabama had they played, or if there was a BCS title game, whether or not Florida State would have played Alabama in that game, or, or Miami would have played Florida State in that game. So there really is no way to tell how that title would have been played out had things have gone differently. However, Florida State missing field goals against Miami in this era would become a grim tradition that would cost Florida State much in the years to come. In any case, Florida State's missed field goal allowed Alabama to win the national championship in the 1992 season. The last national championship Alabama would win until 2008. We're about to get into the really exciting stuff. This next era, the 90s, is the most dominant era of Florida State football. But before we get to that, we're going to have to end this one here. This is a two-part video, guys. I'm sorry for that, but I didn't want this video to be two hours long. I'm going to try to upload the second part of this video on the 5th of next month, about a week from now. I hope you guys will hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and come back next week to watch the final part of the complete football history of Florida State University. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys liked it, and I'll see you guys next week.